Hi, this is Oscar, and I'm talking with you today about the seven stages of artistic development. So these are important because everyone basically goes through them at some point in their life. They all happen in the same order, and uh, I think it's a good thing to learn about because it helps you understand what's going on inside of your mind and why you feel a certain way while you're drawing and why you are at a certain skill level and what to do after you think about that skill level. So the first one is scribbling and this happens when people are about one to five, uh, one and a half years old to four years old. You might have remembered being a kid and your parent gives you a pen and you just go like this and you think, oh, I'm, I'm writing in cursive. It's sometimes you hold it like this and you go crazy. It's I remember I had a period of time where I had a sketchbook full of these realistic human heads from, you know, whatever I was doing. And, you know, I would just draw people on the bus. And this was me as an adult. And uh, my son would have this thing that he would do, which is he would come over and um, he would just grind on the eyeballs and the mouths. <laughs> And he'll just go as hard as he could. And this is the scribbling state. Now, uh, it's important to understand that kids basically can't learn art while they're in this stage. You can't tell them this is how we draw what we're looking at because they don't have the uh, connection between their brain and their hands necessary to do that sort of work. So instead, uh, it's important that you, um, if you, but something is going on and they understand what they're trying to convey even if they're not necessarily um, uh, capable of using the tools at their disposal to uh, convey that message visually so if you see something like this and you ask a child about it they'll tell you oh this is a um, you know this is a monster and he is having lunch with his friends now what I think is interesting about all these stages is I think all of them have something that you can go back to and actually get something out of them so for instance Scribbling is something where uh, I actually take students back to this in terms of uh, single line contour drawings. And if you learn how to do them correctly, it trains you to avoid being overly, uh, overly needling and uh, erasing at your lines. It trains you to think like, how can I just keep the energy going? And this is very important to something that people should think about because a lot of times beginners will just want to put one mark down they don't like it and then they erase it and so I have oftentimes gone back to the scribbling stage as a way that you can think about what you're going to draw and why and it's just something that also teaches you something about the scribbling stage from childhood that I think is important which is there's just a natural abstract beauty to a line that's flowing and kind of nice. This is what I do. I always end up drawing human heads. And, you know, what I've come to realize is like a lot of times something like an eye, you can just get the general shape of it by uh, just going back and forth as a scribble. And then you can figure that stuff out later. Especially like when you get to painting. The scribbling stage is such a good way to start a lay-in drawing because you're going to cover it up with paint anyway. So, like, um, you know, if you just get the abstract shadow shapes down by scribbling, then later on, you're going to have a lot more fun with this. And, you know, you can cover up with paint anyways later, so it's very easy to just put that dot of white on your eyeball. Next up we have what's known as the pre-schematic stage. And this refers to the stage that comes next, which is schematic. But uh, the pre-schematic stage is when kids start uh, around age three and a half to seven years old, uh, understanding like what they want to draw, which is usually like people and cats. And so the thing is, they don't really understand how to put this stuff together. So they'll do something like that and they'll um, figure out like, well, it's almost there and it's almost there. And they they don't understand what a human being is, but they know that there's a big head to start. So then they think, well, now I need eyeballs. So, really weird. Oh, 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 almost.
monster. And then uh, maybe another one. Uh, oh. Oh. And then they oftentimes are like, well, I guess I'll put a uh, mouse way down here and, uh, you know, still like scribble. And they do these things called tadpole men, which is because they know the next is a body. And they don't know what an arm is. But they know it kind of ends in this weird hand thing. So they draw like that and they'll do like little bear claws. And every kid is a little different because um, they're trying to figure this stuff out mentally on their own. And they don't really count the fingers. And a lot of times they'll then like uh, fill in the blank spots that they have. Because they're just trying to think about, uh, this is known as like, um, like they don't really think about it as like a con cohesive picture plane. And so, again, this is something where the idea is there, even if they can't necessarily convey what they're trying to explain. So, uh, you know, if you tell them, oh, you know what else you can do? You can put a black dot in the eyes, and then they look there. Kids will flip out at you for criticizing their drawing, and they don't want to hear this. And it's because um, you're trying to teach them something that's beyond their skill level. Here I have a child putting her hand in front of my drawing. So it's important to uh, think about this stuff as like, uh, you know, asking kids, well, what are you trying to show here? Oh, tell me about this area. So I remember when I was a child in the pre-schematic phase having a chicken drawing contest with my sister. And, you know, we drew like a box to start and chickens have two legs, right? And we drew this on our wall and then like I watched, I looked at this drawing for like the next 120 years of my life or up until I was like 16 years old, I looked at this chicken drawing. And I guess that's a chicken, right? And uh, you still have those in your hand. So a lot of times these drawings are all about like checking the boxes for what people are supposed to have. So they're supposed to have two legs and two arms. And a lot of times you see mandalas with this, where kids start thinking about how they can divide things. And stuff like that. So at this point, uh, a lot of times if somebody came up to you and said, hey, uh, what is that? Uh, kids will take a lot of offense at it and just shut down because they don't want to hear that. Uh, and a lot of times uh, it's important, like, you know, a lot of times the early stages of drawing, the most important thing is just making sure that you keep doing it and uh, you investigate, like, the, the plot points of it. So if I asked you about this chicken, um, or if I asked a kid, tell me about this chicken, and they would say, oh, he's riding a surfboard and his beak is made of pizza. And the story is really cool, even if, like, the rendering, you know, it's, it's not bad. It's just age-appropriate. So the next stage is pre-schematic. And this is something that a lot of people, uh, in, or not pre-schematic, schematic. And I think we all uh, remember doing these, which is we draw a line on this baseline. This is why it's called a schematic. It's like a blueprint of a house from the side. And... So the house has to come up, and you draw yourself and your family. There's your mom, there's your dad. This is what I like about these children drawings, is like the arms always like creep further and further down the body. And like, my daughter draws these things where like the hair goes like that. It's like <laughs> scribble on one side, scribble on the other. And that scribble hair is like the sign of uh, mom and uh, her. And then there's always this happy little son in the corner. And, uh, you know, it's similar to uh, the other ones in that like, there's a story behind it, and you can ask, and they'll tell you about it. But a lot of times, it's the same drawing over and over and over. And uh, this oftentimes also has 
kids drawing what they want to draw. So, you know, my daughter, she draws mermaids a lot. And, you know, she figured out, like, how to draw the mermaid pattern. And she started drawing it over and over. And this ends up leading to the next state, which is the pre-realism crisis, or the, uh, yeah, the pre-realism stage. So, pre-realism. Do you want to show them? So, these are examples of the pre-realist stage. Uh, my daughter's starting to have more and more interest in very specific things, and it's like if you have a friend who draws with you, a lot of times you draw the same thing with them. So it's a lot of fashion, a lot of dresses, a lot of pets. And they're starting to pick up on details of uh, what works and what doesn't. So like uh, in the pre-realism phase, you might see something like this where you, know, you can see her hands going behind her back. And by the way, say thank you to uh, Susan for uh, lending me her drawings here. Uh, so they're starting to understand things like depth perception, um, they're starting to um, have like shape layering and uh, you know you start obsessing over the specifics and like I remember some of the things that I drew a lot as a kid in this stage. Uh, one example of this is like I got really obsessed with the realistic way that how could you possibly draw a dinosaur foot and like that curve that zigzag of a dinosaur foot was something that I was so obsessed with and you know, just like how my daughter had the arm behind the person, as long as the dinosaur leg was in front of the torso and then there was another dinosaur leg behind, that to me was a genius move, a layering of shapes like that. And what's funny is, like, uh, kids start being able to tell and appreciate realism in art. And so, like, a lot of times... Uh, kids are really mean to each other, uh, or it's not even that they're mean, it's just they don't understand how fragile it is and how difficult it is to draw. And so like a lot of times they're doing like the best drawing they've ever heard, uh, done, and you know somebody comes over and says, oh, you know how you can draw a better eye? Then they get super mad that you insulted their drawing. <laughs> and uh, you know, a lot of this stuff becomes very thematic. So, like, I love this stage, and I think that there's a lot of really important stuff in the pre-realism gang, uh, gang phase. It's sometimes referred to as the gang phase because uh, a lot of the times you're drawing stuff with your friends and you all draw the same stuff. So it might be Minecraft, it might be Sonic the Hedgehog, uh, and you all draw the same characters, and you all work is sort of a tribe um, to improve. And you also will start giving each other um, feedback that might be helpful or hurtful. So when I was a kid, I drew killer tomatoes all the time, which was this idea of like an angry tomato. And, you know, true to this stage, I would draw like um, backgrounds and baby tomatoes and robot tomatoes, and cyborg tomatoes, and mummy tomatoes. Tomato? <laughs> yeah, it was it was a weird. And like a lot of kids have this sort of, I mean, you know, what is Minecraft except a bunch of like weird blocky people? And yet kids will draw that until the day they die. So the pre-realism gang phase has that sense of shared culture. And I think that's really important because once you're an adult, a lot of times the the truth of what you liked as a kid is still true. It's still like dinosaurs and robots or fashion or, um, you know, my brother was really into drawing like Nike shoes because he really loved Air Jordan. And, you know, to some extent you become an adult and you can still recognize really good design and quality in a cool shoe. Same thing with kids who draw cars all over and over. Like a lot of people like, car kids that's their thing and you know what you become an adult and a beautifully designed car is still a really satisfying bit of industrial design so I think like it's important to rec recognize that when you were a kid and you were in this pre-realism gang phase you actually did have good taste and it's just that you're starting to like 
uh, think about how you can get to the next level of that stuff. Oh yeah, this is one of those good tricks. Just put some shading on the back legs. So this takes us to the pseudo naturalist stage. Five. Pseudo naturalist. Pseudo naturalist stage is you know, pseudo as a suffix means um, fake or, you know, impostery. And this is sort of what it feels like. You're starting to draw things and recognize uh, things in nature that you want to represent. So uh, it might be human faces and you think, well, and a lot of times this is a lot of peer pressure. So uh, 10 kids draw a face and they all talk about who drew the best one. And then if yours was not the best, you just feel kind of crushed. And it's hard to recognize that you did something that improved your own stuff. So like a lot of times you start seeing um, like uh, the lip shape is the big one for me. People draw this lip shape where it's almost like, um, you know, candy lips. And you might have stuff like almond eye, like the almond eyes is another one. And then these eyelashes come off of it. And as a kid, you're starting to really recognize uh, these are approaching realism, but not quite there. And the pseudo naturalist stage is a time of great uh, self esteem issues about your drawing. And a lot of times, uh, this is where people's uh, development stops. If you decide, or like if you like don't feel like your art is going anywhere, um, you'll stop here. So, like a lot of times, a good example of the pseudo naturalist stage is you'll notice that there's like this nasolabial furrow on people's face. And so you think, well, I got to draw that, right? And so you draw it way too hard and then you wonder why all your faces look like old people. Um, and so this is really about like crisis. And, uh, and yet it's also a time where uh, kids can get out of that point of exploration. Now the exploration side of drawing is so important, but it's a time where you can actually teach them valid techniques. So, you know, this is where you might be able to teach a kid about perspective. And, you know, it's just a math formula pretty much. Uh, but the difference is kids can figure it out. And the problem is like a lot of times you draw these floating boxes and uh, you don't understand why it's important. This also might be a time where kids start learning about shading and if you uh, were ever a kid who liked drawing this might have been a time where you buy like how to draw anime books or how to draw mar comics the marvel way and you start experimenting with some of these advanced techniques and so i i remember reading how to draw comics the marvel way and i would draw these like um uh croquis or maquettes where Spider-Man is built out of these bubbles. And I wasn't yet thinking about like how these bubbles are supposed to go together. And, uh, and yet I could start figuring it out. And like, I remember s feeling like I could understand the difference of pressure on a pencil. So like maybe this is a time where you start understanding that you can draw light and it builds up to something. So this is a good time to start teaching kids about um, instruction, like ideas of art, like value and shading and form, and also you know uh, particulars about different mediums. And a lot of times, uh, it's again, it's where people decide they're never going to do art again. <laughs> so next we get to the decision phase, and the decision phase is something where decision. And this is really fun because, you know, you're just a person and you can, at this point, start recognizing that the art world is vast and varied and maybe you have a specific way that you want to go. Yeah. My daughter, by the way, is listening in the background and she brought me to this. Uh, very proud. She was seven years old and she's experimenting with shading and softness or hardness. And 
uh, you know, that is so wonderful. And like, I think like just these experiments in mark making is something that falls by the wayside when we get older. Here's more of her drawings, by the way. And like, um, trying to like keep the mentality of a child is really important to me. So like, I've always told my daughter, like, just draw whatever you feel like in my book. And so anyways, the decision phase. A lot of times this is when you can basically make any sort of decision. And maybe you go over here and you think, no more art. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to go and get a programming certificate, spend six months learning how to do Java, and then I'll go work for Google and uh, never do art again. But on the other hand, maybe like you actually are career oriented and you can think about this stuff as like, well, um, I'm still going to learn art in the sense of composition. And uh, I'll use this as part of a career as like a web designer or uh you know, there's so many aspects of modern um, technology industries that actually rely uh, really heavily on just like basic understanding of like composition and shapes and gestalt. And so uh, this could be a decision that you make. And a lot of this ends up being more related to modern art, uh, but also it's related to like UI and UX. On the other hand, you might go over here and you think, I want to uh, make a statement with my art and you know maybe um, go and work on Black Lives Matter murals on ca you know in Capitol Hill that cover the whole street and it's something where like um, the importance of it is that people saw it and it made a statement and it affected their mind and um <coughs> on the other hand over here maybe you think I want to do a specific thing like comic books maybe I want to do comics and uh, comics are something where it actually goes back to a lot of these things. Like a, a schematic mentality is all you need to draw a good comic. Um, you know, it's just a character. And that's all you need to necessarily have a word bubble that explains a story. And it's more about the idea of narrative art than anything else. Uh, maybe you want to do something that is uh, going to use all these art skills, like you know, you drew your dinosaurs and your monsters and your aliens, but you go into 3D with uh, 3DS uh, or with Maya, Maya, ZBrush, Blender, Photoshop, and you start uh, taking these ideas and uh, learning how to push buttons on a 3D screen that makes them show up in an XY axis. And so again, it's something where uh, the skill set is still around and maybe you don't have a pencil in hand, but you're applying it to other creative endeavors. And so all these same things like anatomy and form and sculpting with shadows, they all end up paying off when you get into 3D. And on the other hand, maybe you want to just get really good at drawing. And so maybe like you just spend all your time doing figure drawing. So figure drawing is one of those things where uh, you're never going to have uh, a period of time where you do it. And even if you do a bad drawing, it's going to help you develop as an artist. So figure drawing is probably the number one thing that you can do to improve your art. And I don't know how to convey this except with the atelier philosophy. Uh, on one hand, we could learn a bunch of art terms, but the atelier philosophy is a teaching style where you just put kids in a room around a model and they're all at this drawing board and you just grind and you just draw for three hours a day for uh, four years of your life. And Norman Rockwell went to a school in Chicago where at the time he was a student, uh, they had two days a week where it was eight hours a day straight of figure drawing from live models and two days a week of eight hours a day drawing from still life casts. And that was it. And the Atelier philosophy is just you keep grinding on this drawing and you have an instructor over here who says, hey, what's up? This is me. And at what's great about this decision phase is at this point, uh, if a teacher gives you feedback, it can be negative feedback. And it's not like when you're a kid and 
If I say, you know what, this dinosaur does not look that great. Uh, if you told me that as a kid, I would have been crushed and I decided I'd never draw again. When you're an adult, when you enter this decision phase, maybe you're deciding that you want to improve and you recognize the importance of good feedback. So when your instructor says your art sucks, it's not, well, I'm <laughs> goodbye forever, I'll never see you again. It's, I'm going to improve on this. And there's all sorts of things that you can go do. And, uh, you know, it's fascinating to me uh, as somebody who's been drawing for a while, um, how you can end up combining all of these still. So, you know, on one hand, I've done tons and tons of uh, figure drawing. And on the other hand, I remember being a kid and feeling so invested in this idea of drawing things that I found so endearing, like, you know, aliens and movies and stuff that gave me nightmare fuel. And I've had a lot of times where I come back to this idea of what was I thinking about in this early development stage. And so a lot of times when I feel the feelings of the schematic phase and the pseudo naturalist phase, like maybe my drawing's not working. I don't know what to do. Like here's a good example. I'm working on this perspective thing right now. Thumbnails, I love them. The physical drawing, I'm starting to hate it. So you know what? Sometimes I'll just put a mark in and ruin a drawing because that makes me feel like a kid again. And I think, well, you know, now I can just have fun with it. And I stop um, figuring out like how this is something where, oh, this eight inch piece of paper is dominating my existence with feelings of guilt and shame. And I can get back to this idea of having fun. So like, you know, right now I'm drawing some sort of alien freakazoid. And on one hand, you'll notice that I'm still kind of scribbling. It's just that I've learned how to like understand the scribbling as something that's all flow all the time. On the other hand, I'm still in the uh, schematic phase in a way, um, or the pseudo naturalist phase. Um, in that I'm caring about the themes that uh, drive me as a person. I love monsters and gross stuff, and I'm letting that determine what I draw. So I think it's important to draw the things that make you happy. If you love cars, draw cars until your eyes bleed. If you, uh, you want to do fashion design, just do fashion design. Another one that I love is plain air painting, and it's really an excuse to go outside. <laughs> um, on the other hand, I'm starting to have some of the ideas from other phases inform my drawing. So you might notice some anatomical correctness, some idea of uh, why things shade a certain way. And uh, this is a just a ballpoint pen. It's like absolute garbage and it's one of my favorite things to draw because when you draw with garbage materials it makes you a lot less serious about them uh, so a lot of times I'll do things that are experimental in here and this is also one of those decision phase things where when I sit down with a medium I don't necessarily have to read a book on it anymore because I'll just experiment my way into understanding it so like a lot of times the three experiments that I do are well, can I make a value scale with it that goes from light to dark? Can I get a hard edge versus a soft edge? And can I do something that's kind of textural? And so, you know, all my years of life drawing are something where, oh, I'm sorry. So, you know, years of figure drawing has taught me that, like, I need to make sure that I'm focusing on, like, center lines here. And so you'll notice, like, subtle hints where I'm trying to think through this form as I work. And uh, theoretically, this is kind of step seven, which is, you know, 
you're beyond decision phase and uh, you're secure in your decision and um, you start feeling a little more at peace with this stuff. And at that point, it's all about practicing as much as possible. So I hope this gives you some idea of, um, you know, maybe words to uh, put to like what you're feeling when you're drawing. And like, if you're feeling like, man, I suck at this, uh, you know, it's not your fault. Like that's a thing that people feel when they're drawing. And it's all about like um, putting words to it. And a lot of times, if you can name the feeling, as we tell children, uh, it helps you move beyond it. So, like, you know, right now uh, the sky is red because the smoke has returned to Seattle. And, um, you know, I'm talking a lot about feelings, I think, right now. Um, but, like, you know, in the movie Inside Out, when Hockey Island explodes, you know, a lot of times you can have a day where there's so much going on and uh, life is so stressful right now in uh, quarantine that it can feel like your island of drawing is exploding and you're like, I don't have the energy to do this. Um, I can't like put, I can't put words to it, but I know that like I'm just not mentally there. And, you know, that's an okay place to be. And uh, a lot of times, like if you're thinking about this as homework that you have to do for class, you're going to have that feeling. And instead, on the other hand, a lot of times, life is so stressful during quarantine that the only thing that comes to mind for me is like, well, I can't deal with all this trauma. I'm going to go ex I'm going to go escape. I'm going to draw instead of dealing with my problems. And uh, that is also valid. So again, we'll call this the adult stage of drawing. So like, what's my adult stage of drawing? Uh, you know, I think teaching is something I went towards uh, because I like it. And also, you know, it's a little bit more stable as a day job. Um, I'm going back to school for teaching because I want to learn more. And that is partially a decision, but also kind of an adult move, I think. So the same is true for you guys going to college. Um, I do 3D stuff, and I draw a lot of parallels between these things. I do dream journaling. These are things that I've uh, experienced over many years, and now like I feel confident saying that there are things that I do. So like when I wake up in the morning, I try to record my dreams in a drawn format uh, because it's so ephemeral and, and it only lasts for like that 15 minutes after you wake up and it's very important to get those in. I love uh, the realist tradition or um, the representational tradition. In other words, I like stuff that looks like stuff. And so, you know, the idea that a rendering can be improved and be something where somebody looks at and says, that is Horrifying. Oscar, why did you draw that? I definitely know why you, what I'm looking at. It's some sort of anatomy. I like that feeling of having my mind and my drawing match up. And I understand the frustration when it doesn't. And so I, I do believe in the representational tradition, which can maybe get some of that stuff done. I love gross stuff. I love monsters. I love uh, mutations. I love sci-fi fantasy. And, you know, I guess generally I like uh, open so uh, FOSS or open source software, free open source software. And there's other stuff that I like doing, you know. Um, uh, I love painting, especially plain air painting. And I love a la prima painting. A la prima. 
is the fancy painting word for do it in one take. So you sit down and you spend five hours on a painting and you say, I'm done with this forever. And you know, every once in a while I do a painting with two sittings, but I've, I'm so obsessed with this idea of like getting to the next thing in this forward momentum that I've just at this point built it into my style that um, when I do uh, when I do a drawing or a painting, I basically want it to be done that evening and I don't want to work on it the next day. And uh, this is something I should probably think about as my next adult decision is uh, how do I move on from this? So it's important to notice that at this point, I've made my decision and I've kind of committed to them and I can make other decisions. I can still do experiments and try new mediums, but there's a lot of stuff that I don't do in my kit anymore. So I don't do a lot of modern art stuff. I don't like typography. Typography, layouts, magazines, graphic design. Uh, it's a very important skill and it just makes me want to die. <laughs> uh, you know, logo design. I'm going to put an X next to this. I don't like these. You know, you can draw these like happy, happy, you know, families that are jumping things or, you know, like you can draw those till the cows come home and I hate them so much <laughs> and I understand. Uh, there's a lot of stuff where, um, you know, I respect it and I love looking at it. So I love like a lot of political art and I think like um, a lot of times it adds a lot of great stuff to the discussion. And um, I try to be honest about like whether I have the right lived experience or background or platform to necessarily do that stuff. And so a lot of what I like doing is, um, you know, not doing that kind of art, but celebrating people who do do it. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to do this one anymore. I'm, I'm definitely going to do art because at this point, it's something where it's not just about whether I um, am teaching it to other people or whether it's something where uh, I want to get better at it. It's something where it's like uh, mental health drawing, drawing for fun. mental health and I will say that although I don't do modern art I love experimenting so like if you look through the sketchbook this is a this is a glossy sketchbook and uh, somebody gave it to me for free because it's awful to draw in uh, but there are things about it that I do like. So a lot of things like pencil and erasing don't work on this. But it has a lot of things that you can do with markers that are fun. And so like you can see I'm doing lots and lots of just experiments with this. Where I'm just trying to play with a new substrate that I've never experienced before. And see what doesn't work. See what does. So like this was me using uh, India Ink Micron. And I noticed that you could blend them a little bit with a little water. And uh, I did an experiment, and I ruined this drawing. I did the same thing as my son when he was one year old, and he would take my drawings and draw these, <laughs> you know, soulless, scribbled-out eyeballs that I loved. <laughs> I still find these occasionally <laughs> in my old sketchbooks. But so this marker sketchbook was really fun for me to just try and do things. Like this, I think, was me using a sponge or something, putting the marker to it, and then drawing secondarily with that. And a lot of times, I still go back to that representational stuff. So this was a, a study of Bouguereau feet. And also, I have some figure drawing because, you know, I just think that it's like, you know, a gym teacher who doesn't exercise, you know. Uh, I try to do my artistic push-ups every day. So I hope this gives you some ideas about how to approach your decisions about what kind of artist you want to be. Oh, this is another thing I do a lot, which is I watch a movie and I draw whatever I'm reading, watching. So these were some sort of period piece film about people in costumes, and I love that stuff. And so I hope this gives you an idea of what I'm looking for you this quarter. I want you to be solidly in the decision phase.
I want you to have some conviction about the decisions that you're making. And if you don't feel good about where you're at, that's okay. We can decide our way to the end of that. Maybe you try 10 mediums over the course of this quarter and you decide you dislike all 10 of them. Uh, that's okay. Uh, so a lot of what we're going to be doing this quarter is just exploring what you want in your class. 